Uh, our second speaker uh, this evening, now this afternoon, uh, has been the play-by-play -play voice for Badger hockey for 40 years, believe it or not. Not only doing play-by-play -play for Badger hockey, but he's also done football, basketball. He was a sports anchor at NBC 15. I can vouch for that. I find some things in the archives every once in a while of uh, Paul's <laughs> laying around. He's a member of the uh, University of Wisconsin and the Wisconsin Hockey Hall of Fame. So he's here tonight to talk to us about the very personal side of caregiving that's gone with this disease that many of us all know and have, have dealt with and uh, share his story with us. So it's my honor and pleasure to bring up and introduce to you Paul Brown. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Rob. Normally at a sporting event like this, I probably would keep the conversation light. Most importantly, keep it short and say thanks for coming. However, my role here is a little different today because I've been asked to talk about what it's like to be involved with someone who has Alzheimer's disease and explain how difficult it is to be a caregiver. I, ne I never really paid any attention to the disease. It did not affect me or anyone close to me. That all changed on March 2nd of 2007 when my wife Karen was diagnosed with dementia. She was only 59 years old. Now I pay a lot of attention to the disease and what I've learned and experienced, very honestly, it's staggering. For example, if I were to ask you how many people in Wisconsin have the disease, would you say 5,000, 10,000, 25,000? Well, let me answer it this way. If we were going to have a one-day event for all of those people, we would need Lambeau Field in Green Bay and Miller Park in Milwaukee, and they both would be full. If we wanted to have the event in Madison, we would need Camp Randall Stadium, the Kohl Center, Alliant Energy Center, Monona Terrace, and Le Bond Arena. Those five buildings would hold the 112,000 people in Wisconsin that have Alzheimer's disease. More than five million people are living with it in this country now, and the projections are, by the year 2050, 16 million people will have the disease. Now, if we were going to have a one-day event for those 16 million people, we could do it, but it would be awfully difficult. We would need all 351 division basketball arenas in the United States. We would need the top 150 college football stadiums. We would need all 120 stadiums from the NFL the NBA, the National Hockey League, and Major League Baseball. We would also need nine of the other largest stadiums in the world. That would give us 630 total facilities. They'd all be full, and we wouldn't quite be there yet. We would also need the facilities of the Kentucky Derby, the Daytona, and Indianapolis 500. But you know, metaphorically speaking, for those 16 million people, I don't think there'd be any Super Bowl rings, no celebrations of a World Series championship, and no checkered flags when they cross the finish line. For the people with Alzheimer's disease, the finish line is death. And if you're looking at the top 10 causes of death in this country, Alzheimer's disease is currently batting fourth in the most common cause of the death lineup. It's the only disease compared to heart disease, cancer, and stroke for which the mortality rate is steadily increasing. There's no effective treatment, no prevention strategy for this disease. Every 67 seconds somewhere around the world, somebody is being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Today, during this six-hour event, it's conceivable that 300 more people have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. 
about a half a million people die from it every year. Now, if you're going to have that kind of number, think about some of the issues and the problems that are going to come up. Right now, there's already a national crisis concerning the availability of well-trained physicians and health care professionals for the current and the projected number of patients. And those people that work with Alzheimer's patients, they need to have a real passion for helping people. It's a difficult job. The stress levels are tremendous. The burnout rate is extremely high. And quite frankly, they could make a lot more money doing other things. And some people who get the disease live in rural communities. And that's going to cause problems for general practitioners who have heavy patient loads with their time commitments, the education support. That could be issues for them. And so will the resources and facilities that are going to be available. And speaking of facilities, obviously many more are going to have to be built to meet the demand. Now, research shows that about 80% of the people who would need care would prefer to have that care at home. And that decision is going to be based on the person's wishes, the type of care needed, and the cost. And depending on the type of home care you're looking for, on a 24-7 basis, the cost can be as high as $4,000 a week. Now, you can get very good quality care at home for 20 to 25 bucks an hour. But think about it. Five hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, $45,500. But the major challenge now for that family is how are they going to cover the other 19 hours a day, seven days a week for 365 days when they don't have health care help in their home? The costs of dealing with this disease can be catastrophic. I'll share with you the situation that Karen and I are dealing with right now. She was admitted to a memory care facility 369 days ago. If I went to Soldiers Field in Chicago and I stood on the 50-yard line and majestically a dollar came floating down from the 62,000 871 seats in that stadium, I could pick it all up and go, wow, that's within about 500 bucks of our first year number. But each year, the memory care facilities costs are going to go up. As Karen's condition gets worse, that's going to increase the cost. Do you know what? Soldiers Field isn't going to be big enough anymore. I might have to go over to Michigan and stand in the home of the Wolverines and look at the 109,000 seats and go, that's a realistic number probably down the road. And if you think Medicare, Medicaid, and private health insurance are the answer for all of this, you're going to be disappointed. Let's start with being prepared to do extensive research to find out what your options are your age, your total wealth, your income and ability to pay may well determine what you're going to receive and the benefits may vary from state to state. Medicare will pay up to 100 days of skilled nursing home care under limited circumstances. However, custodial long-term nursing home care is not covered. Medicaid comes into play when most of your assets are gone and you're close to being destitute. And when you're on Medicaid, the type of care you receive and the facilities where you can get that care could be somewhat limited. In fact, just recently, I had an owner of a home care business in this area tell me he's not even going to take Medicaid patients. The only way you can get some consistent help with payments on this is through long-term care insurance. So the bottom line is it doesn't take a mathematical genius to realize these numbers just don't work. The system's going to go broke. Pat mentioned it already. The National Alzheimer's Association 
for next year, 2015, the projection is $202 billion. That's right, I said B for billion. One billion, by the way, is a millionaire a thousand times over. How's the average family going to be able to handle this on a year-after-year -year basis? There's no game plan that I know of that's going to win that battle with that gigantic problem. And right now, the best I can do is live in fantasy land and dream that Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Larry Ellison, and Michael Bloomberg all decided to donate their entire estates for the good of the cause, we'd have our $202 billion for next year. I don't know where it would come from the year after that. And by the way, it's not just the patients who have expenses. You have caregivers dealing with care, worried about money, trying to live a somewhat normal life with a tremendous amount of stress and uncertainty. Guess what happens? Some of the caregivers get sick. And reportedly, another $9.3 billion are spent on caregiver costs. Earlier when I mentioned all of those stadiums we would need to hold the Alzheimer's patients, none of those stadiums had caregivers or family in them. But I would suggest to you that if they were in the stands and they were holding up signs that expressed their feelings about how things are going, I don't think those signs would be saying, go Badgers, go Brewers, go Packers. If I were in those, signs, if I were in those stands and I was holding up some signs that expressed my feelings, the words would come from notes that I've written to myself about the journey Karen and I are on. My words on those signs would be anxiety, anger, depressed, stressed, exhausted, fear, lost, hopelessness, panic, sleeplessness, worry, despair, lonely, frustrated, failure, denial, guilt, and bewildered. When you are a caregiver, the person you are helping take care of may well be the most important person in your life. For me, it's my wife, Karen. For you, it might be somebody else. But it's probably somebody that you love very much. And that's what makes it almost unbearable to literally watch the changes right before your eyes. I'm a lucky man to have Karen in my life. She makes me happy. She's friendly, outgoing. She laughs a lot. She's loyal, compassionate, always willing to help others, trusting, caring, like a Pied Piper around young kids. She's very supportive. She's opinionated and she's stubborn and we'll talk stubborn in a couple of minutes. I've known her for 40 years, married to her for 36. Karen's still here, but the love of my life and my best friend is gone. When I say that, I mean recently I handed her a hairbrush, only to watch her use the back side of the brush to comb her hair. I don't know how you'd feel if this most important person in your life, the two of you were standing looking at a reflection in the mirror, and she saw a reflection of herself and she said, who's that? One of the things that I really miss on a day-to-day -day basis is a normal conversation. I can't have that anymore. If I sit down to eat with Karen and there's a glass of water there, she may reach two inches to the left of that glass or one inch to the right of the glass. Karen loves to fish. Used to drive me crazy. All she wanted to fish with was a nightcrawler and a bobber. That's fine, that part of it. Except when she cast it out, she wouldn't let the bobber sit there giving her an indication she had a bite. She'd continuously reel it in. 
Well, about three weeks ago, we tried to set it up for her to have a nice day. We took her fishing. It took about five minutes to realize she didn't know how to hold the rod. She didn't know how to cast it. And she didn't know how to reel it in. And we've been very fortunate in our life to have some very good friends. Pete and Linda Rowe. We've been a lot of places with them. We've done a lot of wonderful things. I was talking to Karen about Pete and Linda. She said to me, who are they? But as tough as those situations are to watch, some of the decisions that I and everybody else that's a caregiver have to make are almost incredible. For about six years, I tried to take care of her myself. Eventually, I realized, like most caregivers do, I can't do this anymore. It was affecting my job, my health, and it was having an impact on the quality of care that I could give Karen. And the point was really driven home to me by my doctor, who I'd been going to for about 25 years. Walked in one day and he looked at me and he said, I'm not exactly sure why you're here, but I know you're depressed, I know you're stressed, I know what you're living with, I know your age, and I know your weight. What I don't know is many people walking around this planet who are dealing with all the issues you're dealing with. And he said, oh, by the way, who's going to take care of Karen if something happens to you? And I can tell you that making the decision to move my wife to a memory care facility was the most difficult decision I've ever had to make. In Wisconsin, when a person goes to a memory care facility, they have to enter that facility on their own. Now remember I said Karen was stubborn and she was in denial about the disease. There was no way she was going to walk into that facility on her own. So what did I do? I put together a fake radio advertising proposal that I was going to sell that facility. I asked three people to help me out. One morning, Karen and I are driving around in the car, and the first person calls me and says, you've got to go make that presentation right now. So I drove over to the memory care facility. Got to the front door of the facility. The second person met us, and we walked through the facility, and we talked about what we were going to put in the radio ads. We literally walked into the memory care unit. The next 10 minutes in that unit, were pure agony. The apprehension and the doubt was almost overwhelming. Every instinct within me wanted to grab her by the arm and say, we're out of here. Then the third person came up and said, we're ready for your presentation now. And that was my cue to what was the most painful decision of my life. I turned around. And I walked out. About 48 hours later, there had been 10 incidents with the staff, two trips to the emergency room. Sunday night, I'm standing with my brother, Daryl, and his wife, Jerry, outside a local hospital. We're kind of looking at one another going, what are we going to do? The hospital wouldn't admit her. And the memory care facility would only take her back if she had one-on-one -on -one care 24-7 until we got her to another hospital for evaluation. One of Karen's sisters, her name is Sally, her and I basically set up shop and kind of lived in a memory care facility for about a week. Sally came in during the day. I took afternoon overnight and early morning shift. And I don't know about you, but trying to sleep on a chair or lay on the floor with a couple of couch cushions really doesn't work that well. One night we even brought in a new air mattress. And I actually got about two, three hours of sleep. Only the next morning to hear this fluttering sound. And I looked down and the air is coming out of the air mattress and I saw a pen jammed into the air mattress. I guess I took that as my reward for putting her in that facility. Seven days later, we get the call she could be admitted to the other hospital. 
What do we have to do? We invent another totally phony plan to walk her into that hospital where she spent 14 days, three different medications. They finally had her calm down and ready to move to another facility. When you visit someone in a memory care facility, you're going to see some dedicated employees who are trying to provide quality care in an atmosphere where the residents are involved, they're active, and they're safe. But if you look closer, you see blank stares, wandering, confusion, sadness, desperation to go home, very little life and energy. You're also going to hear nonsensical conversation and endless repetition of stories. But quite simply, that's the world that they pretty much live in. When I visit Karen, it's heart-wrenching. I see the deterioration and the changes. When I leave, I see the panic, the confusion, and the fear. And it tears my guts out when she pleads with me not to go. And I feel like a total phony when I tell her another one of those damn white lies about why I'm leaving. But let me be perfectly clear about this. I'm not telling you this to feel sorry for poor Paul. Because the bottom line is my story is not a lot different from the thousands of stories that caregivers live with every day in this country and around the world. Being a caregiver is an extremely difficult thing to do. If you look up to take care of in the dictionary, it says to watch over, be responsible for. Those words are true, but it doesn't begin to describe the challenges that a caregiver faces. In addition to the physical and the financial pressures I've already mentioned, there's the mental anguish and a roller coaster of emotions and moods. The responsibilities are enormous. You need to be flexible, unselfish, and have a ton of patience. You need to be very vigilant in watching the care your loved one is receiving. You become a helper, a planner, a decision maker. And caregivers have a life too. They have hopes and dreams and things they want to accomplish with their lives. But sometimes they even have to put those lives on hold. The bottom line is the disease takes a tremendous toll on both those people that are involved. Unless you've been a caregiver or are about to become one, there is no way for you to understand how difficult and devastating it can be. If you have a caregiver in your family, they need your help. They need your support. And when they're having a tough day, and trust me, they'll have tough days. Cut them some slack. And if you're part of a family and you're not involved in the caregiving, you need to get in the game. For God's sakes, don't sit on the sidelines and let somebody else do the work. Forget about being a Monday morning quarterback who second guesses all the decisions that are made. And if you fumble away any opportunity to help out or offer some lame excuse about not coming to visit more often, shame on you. And if your logic for staying away is I want to remember them the way they were, or if it's a reminder of what could happen to me, my reaction to that one is, really? Are you serious? Shouldn't it be about them and not you? Maybe it's time for you to think about how important has this person been in your life? What do they mean to you? Have they always supported and helped you? Have they always been there for you? If the answer to any of those questions is yes, then where are you now? Because maybe there's still time to make them smile, laugh a little, or relive one of the many family stories. So what if they forget it a couple of hours from now? I think it's time for people that do that to put their big girl and big boy pants on and inject a little courage into their spine. Because there's nothing to be afraid of, you cannot catch this disease. It's critical to remember, we're talking about spouses, 
mothers, fathers, brothers and sisters. We're talking flesh and blood here. These people have Alzheimer's disease. They're losing their minds. They're literally living with very little or no dignity left. And they're probably living their golden years in a strange place with people whose names they cannot even remember. They're alone. They're scared. And they're dying. We need to do absolutely everything we can to stop this horrible disease and all the suffering. By you being here tonight, you're in the game. Thank you for that. We may be in our own 10-yard line. And the goal line at the other end of the stadium, long way to go. It may take years to get there. For those of you who are not in the game, please consider joining the team because we can never give up on this and we need your help. For those of you who may have a family history with Alzheimer's or are concerned about getting it, do some research so you know what you're dealing with. Learn the seven stages and the ten warning signs. And if need be, make sure you have the financial and medical power of attorney in place, have an updated will, and all the guardianship paperwork in order. And if you can, please help financially. Support the Alzheimer's and Dementia Alliance of Wisconsin. The money stays local, and it helps people in this area. And support the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Research Center at UW Hospitals. Money goes to research, and research is the only way they're going to find a cure for all of this. And I would also ask you to consider participating in a clinical study, because the disease only affects humans. And the only way to find a cure, slow the progression, or translate the findings from animal research to clinical applications, is by the participation of volunteers in research and donations of human tissue, including the brain. We may not get to the goal line in time to save the love of my life and my best friend, but maybe with your help, we can save others from getting this dreaded disease and spare the people who love them from going through a horrific experience. Thank you.